I would like to welcome everyone to this third in the series of three Van Horn Distinguished Lectures by Professor Harry Atwater of Caltech. And uh, we are happy to be back in uh, what Ernie Banks, Hall of Fame first baseman for the Chicago Cubs, would call the friendly confines, in this case of White 411, our department's auditorium. I have a few observations after the first two lectures in the series. Uh, first of all, we've been fortunate to receive lectures from an extremely productive uh, researcher. Um, and what also struck me was how all three of these lectures have emanated from a, a single innate passionate fascination with the interaction of light with materials and uh, how Professor Atwater has been able to convert that into a, a very influential career. Uh, he's widely cited and clearly he has had many outstanding ideas that have been picked up on, uh, that he's implemented and that others have pursued as well. His talks have been excellent. Uh, he has put his topics in a historical context, which I think is ideal for a series like this. He's grounded his talks in fundamentals that are familiar to all of us here. Uh, plus, he's been able to provide new insights into some of those fundamentals. Like, we may have forgotten that photons have entropy associated with them. And the theme of today's talk will rely on the fact that photons without mass still have momentum. So that's, uh, that's an exciting concept. Um, and in addition, there have been plenty of cutting edge topics covered in his talks for those who are expert in this field. Another thing that is inescapable is as influential as Professor Atwater's own work has been, he has also been quick to acknowledge breakthrough uh, achievements by other researchers in his field. And what that tells me is that when you have ambitious goals that you're striving towards, you sense a, a shared purpose with the community at large, your fellow scientists working in related fields and even fields unrelated to what you're doing, that it takes many individuals and many accomplishments to achieve ambitious goals. And so my last comment is directed really at all of us, but in particular to the younger researchers in the field. Uh, Harry Atwater and I did our PhD work at MIT in the same building at the same time. We overlapped for a couple of years. Uh, I worked on the fifth floor, he worked on the third floor, and maybe that's my excuse, but I never really took the opportunity to get to know Harry Atwater, and I consider that a missed opportunity. It's an opportunity that I hope to make up for by becoming more acquainted with his work now. Um, but I think that should be a reminder to all of us to look at the people who are sitting in the room with us. And maybe they do work two floors away from you, which might seem like an insurmountable barrier at this time. <laughs> but make the effort, make the effort to get to know what your colleagues are doing. Because you have no way of knowing on April 19th, 2018, which of these colleagues will cross paths with you again, and with which of these colleagues you will be able to renew your own shared sense of purpose. So with that, let's welcome the third lecture. Professor Atwater, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mark, and I want to say also thank you to the faculty, uh, the grad students, and the undergrads. It's been a, a very enjoyable week, very productive, and I've learned uh, uh, many things about Kate Western this week. I've learned you have uh, a faculty that uh, is bringing to the School of Engineering and to the campus a very vibrant research program that actually has many ties to industry, which is uh, uh, really exciting to see. I see that as a sign of real health. Um, and I see a faculty that's very, very collegial uh, and uh, genuinely seems to like one another, which is great. Uh, that ends up reflecting indirectly and being uh, great for the students as well. Uh, and then finally, I'll say that through the uh, lunches and dinners we've had, I found out that Cleveland has a fantastic places to eat. And I, I want to say thank you for that. And uh, my view of Cleveland is uh, transformed it's as part of the cosmopolitan universe. Uh, so I wanted to uh, 
start today um, and this is going to, I, I, I'm going to beg your indulgence to uh, go in a direction that's very unorthodox. Um, and in the spirit, this, this, uh, for those of you who are from the metallurgy side, uh, think about this in the spirit of Michael Ashby's material selection kind of initiative. So what we're going to do is kind of a material selection analysis on what are the characteristics of materials that we would ask for for interstellar travel. Uh, and this is a sort of mind-blowing concept and literally out of this world and we're going to carry forward and, and, and take a look at that today. Uh, this little thing right here is uh, an artist rendition of what such a spacecraft would look like and this by the way is not the Earth. It is a planet uh, around another nearby star. So the concept here is to develop the engineering principles that I think are almost within reach to develop spacecraft that will allow us to travel within our lifetimes um, to uh, nearby stars. Okay, the work itself, um, and once again, is uh, uh, only made possible and completely responsible, uh, the people who are completely responsible for the advances are this uh, outstanding group of uh, uh, young people, students and postdocs and research scientists who um, are passionately engaged in it. So I want to start with the a notion, uh, each of us is in some measure a scientist and also an engineer. Uh, and uh, uh, one of our Caltech heroes uh, opined once that scientists uh, discover the world that exists and engineers create the world that never was. Uh, so what we're going to try to do today is think a little bit about that world that never was and, and, and don our engineering caps and, and try to engage this problem. So let's think about this problem. And we're going to think about it in terms of uh, characteristic performance and complexity where our figure of merit is going to be the power per unit weight. Uh, and if we go from uh, you know, historical examples of power per unit weight in the uh, pre-machine age, uh, pre-internal uh, combustion machine age, um, we can actually track and, and sort of uh, uh, track the progress in terms of uh, increase in power per unit weight in watts per kilogram. Uh, and what you'll see here as we go from uh, to the automotive age, from the horse and buggy age, we get into the range of uh, tens of watts per kilogram uh, uh, with, a, with an efficient car, with an inefficient racing car, we can get up to about a kilowatt per kilogram. Um, here uh, with uh, a, uh, a, uh, a, a, a a NASA space plane, and a Boeing uh, 747, we're in the range of 1 to 10 kilowatts per kilogram. Uh, here when we go to the space shuttle or the SpaceX uh, Falcon Heavy rocket, we're now getting into the range of 10 to 100 kilowatts per kilogram. Uh, and up here is a special spacecraft. This is a Dawn spacecraft. It actually has a, a historical connection to the Cleveland area because it is a spacecraft that is driven by solar electric propulsion driven by an ion engine. And the ion engine was actually invented by a guy named Harold Kaufman who worked at what was then NASA Lewis Research Center, now NASA Glenn Research Center, uh, and uh, allows us a method of propulsion that allows us to get up here uh, to the uh, uh, very high uh, uh, power, uh, power densities. Uh, and in fact, we'll see importantly also the mass uh, uh, and the terminal velocity of the propellant will actually define the final speed that we can get to for spacecraft. Um, and, um, so, and, and importantly, this is a spacecraft that because it has an ion thruster is capable of not only doing flybys of remote uh, celestial bodies, but it actually can uh, use its thrust to break and insert into orbits uh, uh, as well. Um, so the question is what lies up here? What lies up in this uh, uh, megawatt per kilogram or higher level. So this is one of the things we're going to talk about today. Uh, and so this is, this is a problem where inevitably at every step along the way you, you already know that materials play uh, an incredibly decisive role in determining whether or not we can make these advances. So let's think a little bit about the strategy that we're going to adopt. Um, the strategy for these kinds of uh, machines that we already know about is one where conceptually the paradigm is that the power and the propellant are both on board the vehicle. Okay? 
So we carry our fuel with us and that gives us range. We can fly around the world, but that fuel to weight ratio then limits the cruise speed and, the, and ultimately limits the range. The special thing about the spacecraft that I showed you, the Dawn spacecraft born here in Cleveland, uh, at least the ion engine part, is that it separates, uh, it, does, it breaks this conceptual paradigm a little bit in the sense that the power is external even though the propellant is on board, okay? Uh, so the power is solar power. The solar power produces DC electricity. The DC electricity is used to drive the ion engine. The propellant in the ion engine is a gas or in some cases molecules like C60. Uh, and this results in an increase in power per unit mass. Um, the ultimate, of course, is where the power and the propellant are both external to the spacecraft. Uh, and we're going to explore that uh, as well. Okay, so the outline of my talk, I'm going to begin first talking about ultralight systems uh, that are maybe a little closer to this world in the sense that they're things that will be useful to us in the coming era of commercial and gov government-led space exploration, which are ultralight power systems uh, based on very lightweight photovoltaics. Uh, I'll say a little bit about what some of the options are there. And then I'm going to talk about laser-driven spacecraft propulsion that will allow us to uh, potentially go to the stars. Um, so uh, let's think about where we are with regard to solar power. So uh, in the 1990s to 2000, we developed a technology that allowed us to develop the International Space Station and many commercial communications and navigation satellites. Uh, and then uh, in the 2000 to 2010 range, we started to see uh, spacecraft like the Dawn and the Smart spacecraft uh, that have solar electric propulsion and they uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an advance. Uh, there's another type of very interesting uh, spacecraft we'll talk about called a solar sail that uses uh, radiation pressure, photon momentum pressure coming from the sun as the propellant. Uh, very low impulse, uh, but it allows, uh, it, uh, it's something that where there are now these uh, types of spacecraft are coming to reality. You have to be patient, of course, uh, with this kind of spacecraft. Um, and so what is, uh, people are thinking about now are spacecraft where this concept of marrying solar electric propulsion with uh, solar power would allow us to really build a sort of workhorse spacecraft in space where we could actually uh, manipulate things, not only the spacecraft's orbit, but perhaps uh, payloads. Uh, also, we can uh, develop large scale platforms for power generation in space. And that has some very interesting implications that I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, we've started an a initiative, a space solar power initiative at Caltech that I'll share you, uh, some uh, initial results with you about. Uh, and that, uh, the ability to bring uh, large amounts of power uh, to lightweight structures in space has many kinds of implications for uh, the way we actually look at our world and the way we communicate. The ability to bring forward systems for uh, global uh, uh, and monitoring uh, and, and uh, communications via global internet, which is actually starting to become a, a very big commercial, there's a big commercial impetus for this right now. Um, so this is the kind of uh, conceptual driver for the project that we've started at Caltech. The notion that by taking a modular design where we build a little unit element tile that's 100 square centimeters in diameter, or, or, or in size, is square tile, actually rectangular. Um, this structure generates solar power on one side by photovoltaic energy conversion, uses an integrated circuit to convert the solar DC power to microwave energy, and uses that microwave energy to drive a set of antennas that is on the other side of the tile. And then by arranging these tiles in a dense array, we can create a phased array. In my lecture yesterday, I talked about phased array radars. Uh, and this same phased array concept can be used for power beaming. It's already been demonstrated by, by NASA more than 15 years ago. Uh, and with a large aperture, we can beam power from long distances quite precisely. Now this is, of course, a completely uh, uh, fictitious artist's view. But the concept here is that by starting with this unit element, that is uh, mass manufacturable and modular, uh, where there is no central element. This could easily be uh, flexibly expanded from the single cell to the module to a large system level. Uh, and different systems will have different uh, power requirements. Um, and, and the concept for, the power, uh, for a stationary power generation would be to launch this into geo, uh, uh, geostationary orbit. 
Um, uh, smaller systems could be located in low Earth orbit to be used for remote mission power, beaming power to uh, places where there is no utility network, for example, where you need continuous large amounts of power uh, day and night. Uh, electric powered aviation, uh, beaming power actually down to remote electric powered fleets of airplanes that fly uh, 24 hours a day. This is something that has also attracted uh, some attention. Uh, global internet and another concept called bi-static radar where you locate the radar uh, that's used for imaging and range finding not on the earth but uh, uh, remotely in space and it communicates uh, with uh, 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 images uh, and uh, range finds objects in the sky but then uh, which are then detected on the earth. So there's a range of technologies that uh, can take advantage of ultralight power systems in space combined with the ability to beam power wirelessly. Um, so the concept that we have is to a modular concept where we start with a single tile and build these tiles into strips. I don't have time to tell you about this uh, all today, but uh, this is something that within the concept, uh, context of our Space Solar Power Initiative, working together with my colleagues Sergio Pellegrino and uh, Ali Hajimiri at Caltech. Sergio is an aeronautical engineer that specializes in the construction and deployment of large-scale space power systems, or space, space systems, uh, to build things that are deployable. Uh, and this structure, for example, 60 meters by 60 meters, is about the same size as uh, the solar sail that I showed you on one of the previous uh, slides. And then these can be assembled in formation flying uh, uh, arrays of spacecraft uh, uh, at whatever scale the application demands. And so just to give you, uh, 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 particularly for the students to think about this, what is the concept or what, is the, what are the implications of having uh, a space-based power system? This is something, by the way, that has been a uh, uh, sort of twinkle in the eye. It's been a, a sort of a, a, an imaginative idea, always out of reach, ever since the beginning of the space program. And in fact, I think even before that, uh, people like Asimov even imagined uh, this, this kind of concept, where uh, large power generation in space could allow, uh, could uh, generate power that could be beamed wirelessly to the Earth. So let's just do sort of an, an energy analysis on this. First of all, in space, there's about 30% higher power density than there is on the Earth because of the uh, uh, absence of the atmosphere. There's uh, more light uh, overall and more in the blue and ultraviolet. Uh, with a uh, ground station uh, consisting of an array of rectennas, that is basically uh, devices that convert microwave energy to DC. These are all very straightforward and already exist. Uh, they can be made very inexpensively. Um, we can then think about beaming power uh, 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 24 hours a day, um, uh, seven days a week. Uh, and so then if we think about the implications of this, compared to the uh, predictably intermittent solar power on the surface of the Earth, we get nine times more power. So, uh, the, the, and, and it's continuous. So this actually is a, a scheme uh, for, a, uh, for a geostationary or uh, m median Earth uh, uh, or orbit uh, 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 um, uh, basing would not uh, uh, require storage uh, uh, except in very intermittent conditions. So this is, this is of course, uh, uh, a long way off and uh, uh, may, may be uh, difficult to realize, but it, at least it gives you an idea to think about how you could deploy these systems uh, and what the merits might be. And in fact, we've done uh, uh, economic analyses of what, how inexpensive this would need to be and how lightweight, how low the launch cost would have to be to rival the cost of terrestrial solar power. Uh, and we're not orders of magnitude off in our current kind of engineering approach to how you would do this. Um, so here's, for example, how the conversion efficiency would look. Suppose you start with sunlight in space uh, and you have uh, losses due to the uh, concentration of sunlight, the conversion, the DC to RF conversion, the RF transmission and downlink, and then the uh, conversion of RF to DC, uh, and then the conversion of DC to AC power grid. Uh, and so of the power that's available in space 24 hours a day, you could uh, ultimately bring into the AC power network on the ground somewhere between 5 and 19 percent of that power. So that's quite an interesting concept. So I want to uh, start here and uh, mention that uh, we have actually built 
uh, the very first, I'm going to stop here for a minute and show you that we have built and realized the, ver the unit element, um, which is the tile. Um, and this is a, uh, an initiative that uh, uh, we, we've taken over the last couple of years. Um, and this is the tile. Um, let's see if I can make this. There we go. Um, so this is a tile that's sitting under a solar simulator. It has trough concentrator photovoltaic elements. I'll describe these in a minute. Um, and on the bottom here is, uh, in the middle you'll see in a minute, there's a uh, RF CMOS integrated circuit designed by my colleague Ali Hajimiri that converts DC power to 10 gigahertz microwave energy. And then there's an array of thin film microwave patch antennas that are in this plane here. The DC power is generated here, converted to RF, and then fed to these antennas. And you'll see that we can actually, under the solar simulator, uh, down here, uh, let me see if I can get this out of the way. Um, here is a, this is a, a rectenna array that's being held by one of the students here. And you can see this little LED that's being lit right here. That's uh, microwave energy that's being beamed from these solar cells, these thin strip solar cells located on the concentrators. Uh, being fed, there's the integrated circuit chip. Here is the RF antenna array. Uh, and then this is sitting on just a, a fiberboard structure. Uh, and it's beaming power down uh, to uh, this uh, little LED that's attached to the rectenna. So the power is being, it's a little bit hard to see because this, this thing is in the way. But there's the LED being lit up uh, by the rectenna. So this is showing the unit element of this uh, uh, structure uh, this solar tile in operation. Okay, so let's say a little bit about uh, generating power in space uh, and what some of the issues are. I talked on, uh, on my, in my first lecture on Tuesday about uh, power generation uh, using efficient uh, power generation materials uh, like uh, gallium arsenide. And so let's talk a little bit about the weather in space and the space environment. Uh, here in Cleveland, we have cloudy weather. It's a little cool. Sometimes it rains. In space, we have much more severe weather. Uh, we have high energy particle radiation. We have a high UV content. We have a very extreme thermal cycling. We have vacuum. That is good in most respects. If you're close to the Earth, you also have atomic oxygen, which is very reactive. Um, you can also see, depending on where you are, uh, you're, if, you're, if you're outside the Van Allen belts that are the, um, uh, the uh, 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 basically serve to shield the Earth from uh, these high energy particles that produce magnetic fields that shield the Earth, uh, then we have exposure to the full flux of these, uh, of these particles. Um, and so most spacecraft of the ones that I showed you on my opening slides are powered by 3,5 compound solar cells of the kind I talked about on Tuesday using gallium arsenide and gallium -unium phosphide. They're multi-junction cells for high efficiency, uh, but they require something to insulate them from this weather, a sort of an umbrella to prevent the interaction with the weather. Here's the problem. Uh, with something like a gallium arsenide solar cell, if we start at the beginning of life with some power, uh, some output efficiency at the beginning of life, depending on the flux of uh, uh, protons between uh, 10, 100 kilovolts and 10 megavolts, I could lose more than half of the power generation over the lifetime of the, uh, and this is a real problem. And, and uh, likewise, with high energy electrons that are part of the solar wind as well, uh, between, uh, which are of the order of a megavolt, there's a whole energy distribution from a little less than a megavolt to a uh, few megavolts, we can also lose half the power. So therefore we need, uh, these materials are very radiation sensitive, and we need to put shielding on top of our solar cells. So the most common design for these kinds of power systems like the one on the International Space Station all feature this design where there's a photovoltaic cell, there's a very thick layer of glass. I, I showed you techniques uh, on Tuesday for making extremely thin lightweight solar cells. But the problem is I can make the solar cell as light as I want and I still have to put 50 to 100 microns of glass in front of this solar cell and I've lost all the weight advantage I had uh, from making the solar cell thin. I have to also put a radiation shield on the back surface. And then the mass density gets to be so high that I can't get 
uh, to uh, more than a kilowatt per kilogram. I can't reach the objective that I was trying to get to. So I have to find some other way to solve this problem. Uh, so one, and, and this sort of illustrates it dramatically, the solar cell itself consists of a front contact, metal back contact in the cell, but I have to put shielding on top and on the bottom, and the shielding represents, this is the saying the same thing uh, in this pie chart, most of the mass, uh, and so that would limit the power density I could get to, to about 400 watts per, per kilogram. Um, so and our goal is to get to 1 to 20 kilowatts per kilogram. So therefore, we're going to go to concentration. And why would we do that? That's because what we can do now is instead of putting a radiation shield over the entire surface of the photovoltaic, I, I, in a concentrator, I work with very small cells. The cells are millimeter wide strips. This is a trough concentrator, a one-dimensional concentrator, where the incident light is uh, concentrated by this parabolic mirror onto the PV cells on the mirror in front. It's a multifunctional design. Uh, by the way, this acts as a structural support, a thermal conductor, a radiation uh, shield, uh, and a thermal radiation management system for the whole module. So it's fairly highly engineered. Um, and the, this structure of the mirror uh, consists of a number of optical coatings that are used to uh, uh, emit efficiently into the cold background of space uh, and to reflect op uh, visible light efficiently onto the photovoltaic. So this is, and I showed you the tile, um, and the tile consists, and the, these structures uh, have a mass density of 220 grams per square meter. It's a pretty lightweight structure. That's like, uh, 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 like a, uh, about, a, about the same weight uh, per unit area as a number 10 envelope or so, uh, maybe with a letter inside. Um, but that's about the mass density of the structure. These are carbon reinforced, uh, carbon fiber uh, reinforced uh, structures. Uh, um, and that are, that are um, molded, uh, specially laid up and molded, so composites, and upon which we spread a polymer that uh, uh, capillary flow smooths out the surface to make an optical quality mirror. So actually these are ultralight, you know, high performance components made with space grade materials, all carbon fiber, no, uh, and, and the only metal materials are a few hundred nanometer thick metal uh, thin films. So, okay, even with this kind of structure, this is about the limit to what we can get to, and we're still stuck with this uh, radiation shielding, and it turns out that this structure, I have to point it exactly at the sun, so it's a concentrator, and that limits the versatility of my spacecraft. Um, so I, I, what I'm really interested in finding is a material that has very low mass per unit area, uh, but wouldn't have the complications of the, the mater materials uh, sens uh, sensitivity to radiation that gallium arsenide has. So one of the materials that has been leading um, the worldwide research community on an incredibly uh, energetic uh, development cycle over the last five years are the so-called organo-lead halide perovskites. This is a, not an oxide perovskite that is familiar to many of you. It is a uh, perovskite, it's a perovskite crystal structure, uh, but one which has um, halogens like iodine on the, uh, uh, it, rather than oxygen on, on the oxygen, on the, uh, 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 the, the perovskite octahedral lattice. Uh, and it has uh, typically organic cations uh, and then uses something like lead uh, as, the, uh, as the center B atom in the ABO3 crystal structure. These materials are remarkable photovoltaic materials they are seemingly immune to defects. In polycrystalline films, they have performance that rivals that in terms of the luminescence and the voltage performance, uh, the gallium arsenide. I showed that in some of the slides on Tuesday. They are very highly absorbing. Uh, you can spin coat them as thin films. Uh, you can doctor blade them. You can spray coat them onto polymers. Uh, and the thing that's remarkable is by putting them onto a polymer substrate, uh, it's already been demonstrated that you could have a power density of 20 kilowatts per kilogram. So uh, one of the downsides and the reason they haven't sort of overtaken uh, the terrestrial PV business is that they are moisture sensitive. Now in space, of course, there's no water. Uh, on Earth, there's plenty of water. And so that's the thing that's holding them back. Uh, and much of the research in this field for in photovoltaics is focused on how to solve the environmental durability problems related to moisture uptake. There are 
uh, dissociation reactions for the perovskite uh, 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 molecular structure that uh, are fundamentally decompose in the presence of water. Um, so, and the, and, and the limiting efficiencies for these materials are, 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 are very high. So we decided to look at the space weather conditions uh, uh, for per thin film perovskite solar cells. So we made a variety of thin film perovskite solar cells. These aren't particularly efficient. We've made other cells with efficiencies as high as 20%. They're not as high as the gallium arsenide cells. But the specific power, the weight per, or power per unit weight, is quite remarkable. Moreover, as we irradiate with electrons, this is done at the radiation facility Dynamitron at JPL, Here's the gallium arsenide data. We're losing half the performance. Here's the perovskite data, completely unchanged in its power. This is without any radiation shield. So that implies that I could potentially, at least in terms of the electron performance, operate this with no radiation shield. Here is with proton irradiation. And this story's a little, the plot thickens a little bit. Uh, same kind of cell here. It's an absorber layer. We have electron and hole transport layers here, nickel oxide for hole and PCBM for electrons. And then we have uh, a transparent substrate here that this has been made on. So uh, upon proton irradiation, we find that the solar cell voltage stays exactly the same. The short circuit current density stays exactly the same, but the fill factor changes. That seemingly suggests that there's some series resistance in the cell in this absorber layer we think it might be due to proton-induced deactivation of doping. Or it may be that it is changing the properties of the interfaces here. Nonetheless, upon annealing at 90 degrees C, and by the way, every time a satellite goes from the dark side of the Earth to the bright side of the Earth, it goes from roughly uh, 100 degrees C to minus 50 or 100 degrees C or so. So that you could think about a low Earth orbit as an anneal cycle. This, uh, solar cell recovers its performance completely. So this is a remarkable thing. So uh, we, and, and we're collecting now uh, many gigabytes of data, not as many terabytes as Roger would hope us to collect, but um, we're, we're, we're collecting a lot of data. In fact, we, we are look forward to working with, with his group on the data analytics. Um, this is a remarkable uh, statement. It says that this is a potentially radiation hard ultralight photovoltaic material. Um, and so if we can simply encapsulate this in lightweight polymer materials, I think it's uh, easily achievable that we can get into the maybe 20 to 25 kilowatts per kilogram uh, specific power density. For reference, today's spacecraft are typically in the few hundred watts per kilogram range. OK, so now I want to shift to my second topic to talk about space exploration and, and sort of what is the status of where we are today. The current status, if we look at the, here's a, here's a map of the solar system and a map of the solar system out to some nearby stars. Here's Alpha Centauri, for example. Um, here's, here's, here's the, this is a, notice that this is a, a, a log scale. Um, and you can see here. This is the number of spacecraft that have made it to this distance, OK? That we have only five spacecraft that have ever been launched in all the space programs uh, launched by all the countries around the world that have ever left the solar system. So for example, here's Voyager moving at 17 kilometers a second past the heliopause out into the Oort cloud, the interstellar medium. Um, <coughs> But look how far we have to go. Here's the, the heliopause is um, here uh, at, at a, uh, a distance in AU of 100 AU, astronomical units or Earth units. Whereas to get to Alpha Sen, we have to get to a million AU. So clearly, we're going to have to go at a speed that is faster than this. So how are we going to do this? OK, let's think about this. And the fundamental equation you need to know, and, and today you're going to become, all become aeronautical engineers. OK? Um, so the most important equation to an aeronautical engineer is called the rocket equation. OK? And it expresses the velocity uh, that we can achieve in terms of the uh, 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 exhaust velocity, in terms of the mass of the payload to the mass of the fuel. Uh, and this is a very, very sobering and discouraging equation. Notice that this ratio of masses appears in a log term. 
So for a chemical engine where we're using particles for propellant, the ejection velocity of the propellant is typically less than five kilometers per second. And the amount of mass to get to 10% of the light speed would be uh, here um, uh, 10 to the 4,500 times the mass of the payload. So this is just a, a laughable number. Even with an ion thruster, the kind of spacecraft like the Dawn spacecraft, we can get to higher, uh, we can use electrostatic forces to eject the particles through electric fields at much higher velocities, but still we have just ridiculously large uh, fuel to payload ratios. So the only fuel that's going to allow us to get there is light itself. And in this case, in the rocket equation, the mass of the payload and the mass of the fuel uh, uh, can be the same. And the final velocity of a recoiling uh, photon here, instead of being 300 kilometers per second, is 300,000 kilometers per second. So that is what is going to make the difference for us. So we can say this another way, um, uh, in terms of the time we would need to get uh, to uh, Alpha Centauri. So if we think about chemical rockets and we apply Newton's first law, uh, and we, we take the fastest spacecraft that uh, uh, technology has ever provided, the New Horizon spacecraft, to get to Proxima Centauri would take 79,000 years. Um, on the other hand, if we now use light uh, as our propellant, as our working fluid, uh, reflected from the surface of the spacecraft, uh, it's reflected at the, at the, the light speed, uh, and so we impart a momentum two times the energy over the light speed. Uh, and now to get to 20% of the light speed, uh, I'll show you at least a scheme by which we might be able to do this, we could get to Proxima Centauri in 21 years. And this, project, this concept uh, was, was inspired by the many spacecraft that have already been developed over the last 20 years. In fact, there's a, quite a, in, 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 in this year and next year, there's actually going to be quite a, 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 a blossoming of technology in, on, on solar sails. This is inspired by the spacecraft that we already have that are propelled by radiation pressure. These are ultralight. Um, these are typically these sails, like the JAXA solar sail. This is the only one that has really uh, been used for interplanetary flight. These are basically demo uh, uh, objects. Um, this one uh, is a, a, a basically a, about a 10 micron thick capton sheet that's aluminized uh, with about 200 square meter area and has a small photovoltaic power conversion element in the center here. So this, is, this offers some mode of inspiration for this, this process. So let's think about this uh, question more broadly. And this is uh, actually uh, was stimulated. This idea of going to stars is not only stimulated because uh, of the technology that uh, people are beginning to realize we may have some elements of. It's been stimulated by planetary scientists uh, uh, like my colleague Andy Howard and Michael Brown at Caltech and others who have over the last 10 years, if you've been reading science or nature, you've seen that there's been an explosion in the number of planets that uh, are being discovered. In fact, on Monday, uh, NASA launched the TESS spacecraft, the Transiting Exoplanet Sky Survey Telescope. Um, the idea is that it's a telescope that in space will you point at a distant star and as a planet transits in front of the star, the star acts like a backlight that allows you to determine many properties of the planet, its size, its orbital period, its atmosphere, uh, and tell you about the viability of this planet for life. And what the uh, astronomers have found is that fully one quarter of all the stars that they uh, uh, have, have cataloged have planets within the habitable zone. So habitable zone means that the temperature on that planet is close to 300 Kelvin. And that planet probably hosts an atmosphere. Uh, so that's a remarkable number. So if we think about you know, the odds for detecting life outside our solar system, this is this is a pretty encouraging sign. So the question is, can we get there? Maybe. Um, so where, what's our planetary neighborhood look like? Um, so uh, if we look here um, it, w where we are, uh, th then uh, we can see the planetary neighborhood looks like this. Uh, this is a map in light years. 
Uh, we're here at the center. Uh, Alpha Centauri is uh, about four light years away. Barnard star is about 10 light years away. There are a number of stars here within 10 light years uh, uh, of, of, of the Earth. OK, so that led this group of people. Um, maybe you recognize this gentleman who uh, passed away uh, recently, Stephen Hawking. Um, this is Yuri Milner. Um, Yuri Milner is an internet billionaire um, uh, who uh, um, has uh, been an extremely successful entrepreneur who has also has a PhD in physics. Uh, and he has founded the Millennium Breakthrough Prizes for basic so fundamental science. And he is also the person that is uh, underwriting a research program that has already begun and is actually going to begin, for those of you professors sitting in the front row, has issued RFPs for research, one on the laser system that I'll tell you about in a minute, and another on the light sail, uh, which is coming very soon. So here's the concept. To use a laser that's based on the Earth, um, that has a wavelength, operating wavelength, in the 1 to 1.5 micron range, that's based on the laser technology that's likely to be scalable, with a power of 100 gigawatts optical power. So this is the largest laser system that would have ever been built by humanity. Uh, size, aperture size in the range of a few hundred square meters to a kilometer. So this is nothing like this has ever been built before. But it's, there's, there's no law of nature or technology that stands in the way. The second is a light sail. Um, and the concept is then to be propelled by radiation pressure over a time of 20 years at 20% of the light speed uh, with a spacecraft that has a weight of about one gram. Uh, the, the light sail has a weight of about one gram, payload roughly a, the, the same as the spacecraft itself. OK, so let's see what this whole system might look like. And this is an impressionistic video from Breakthrough. Um, this is a phased array laser. Uh, uh, it's probably not the way it would really look. Uh, and this is the light sail, at least some artist version of the light sail, launched in low Earth orbit. Uh, and a phased array laser that using uh, individual lasers that are power combined trains its uh, large aperture focus onto the light sail and propels it um, uh, from uh, an initial height of about uh, uh, 60 million kilometers out to about the Mars orbit uh, with CW laser radiation uh, at a power density of a megawatt per square uh, centimeter or 10 gigawatts per square meter over a distance of 4.3 light years from uh, Earth to uh, Proxima Centauri. So it needs to fly, let me turn the lights down a little bit. Uh, through interstellar medium, the Oort cloud is the interstellar medium, and we're now going through the interstellar medium. Uh, the sail would, uh, if we could, would, we'd like to orient it end on so it uh, wouldn't impinge on uh, particles in the interstellar medium. We have a lower physical cross section. Uh, and may be able to communicate during the, its uh, trajectory and, and navigate uh, somewhat. Uh, and now it's passing Alpha Centauri. Uh, and uh, on its way to Proxima Centauri. So Alpha Centauri is a bright uh, star. Alpha Centauri, Proxima Centauri is an M dwarf star. It's a small star that's smaller than the sun. Uh, and then it passes around a planet, uh, or passes by a planet uh, uh, in the Proxima Centauri system called Proxima B, and flies by, takes pictures, uh, and beams them back to the Earth using a laser communication system. Uh, coming back to the Earth. So that's the, uh, the concept uh, that is envisioned by this point design uh, that I've described to you. Uh, and um, let's see, I think that's basically it. OK, so what do we need to do that? What we need are three elements. We need uh, the photon engine. That's this large area, large aperture laser, uh, phased array laser. And one of the things that makes this intriguing to almost everybody that thinks about it is that all of the individual elements at the basic unit element already exist. This would use uh, uh, solid state pumped kilowatt pumped diode lasers. These are used by laser cutting and welding uh, facilities already, kilowatt lasers. Uh, a light sail, 
uh, and a star chip. The star chip, versions of this star chip have already been built. Uh, it's basically nothing more than the inner workings of your cell phone minus the battery and the display and so forth. Integrated circuit, uh, camera chip, uh, and so forth. The light sail needs to be lightweight, weighs about a gram, has an area of a few uh, square meters, uh, and therefore has a thickness for most materials in the range of a few tens to a few hundred nanometers. Okay, what about the photon? I'm just going to say briefly about the photon engine. The photon engine we imagine would be a ground-based laser system. Uh, the best place to put such things are on lar uh, dry mountaintops like the Atacama Desert in uh, Chile, which is where uh, many of the world's telescopes, this is the large European telescope la located on the, in the Atacama Desert. Uh, in fact, there are some places so dry here it hasn't rained since the Spaniards discovered uh, uh, this region in South America. Um, so that's important because that makes the atmosphere highly transmissive for the laser. Um, and there's a, you'll notice here in the 1 to 1.5 micron region, there's a, a pretty good transmission window through the atmosphere. Uh, obviously, there would be scattering from uh, and uh, refractive index distortion. Uh, and in order to compensate for that, this has already been demonstrated, the, the Air Force, one puts a beacon in orbit that takes off a portion of the light beam and uses it as a reference um, to determine the refractive index effects of the atmosphere. So the Starship, as I mentioned, really is nothing more that takes advantage of uh, uh, image sensor and integrated circuit technology. Um, and uh, being able to make these in thin film form, which we can already do. And in fact, uh, several of the members of the Starshot team have already developed prototype chips of this kind. Uh, one can hope to and want to include many more sophisticated instruments into these chips that can do measurements beyond taking pictures or perhaps spectra. So I want to concentrate most of my remarks in talking about the light sail itself. Uh, because this is where a lot of the materials uh, science and engineering lies. Um, and so the, 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 this essentially tells you what uh, is the velocity that we can get to. Uh, this dotted line represents the velocity of the Voyager spacecraft. Um, and, and this is, is the point design here, 20% of the light speed we're trying to get to. So what are the challenges? Uh, to have efficient momentum transfer, uh, maintain the shape of the sail, to have it ride the beam stably and passively with a controllable trajectory and good stability. The material itself, of course, is being heated at uh, steady state at a megawatt per square centimeter. So absorption is very important, our, as are mechanical stresses. Uh, and then, of course, we have to figure out a way to make such meter square objects um, that, that would uh, and deploy them in space. OK. so. This is the basic equation that we need to f use to uh, understand what the uh, sort of material selection requirements are. The final speed I can get to is based on the power times the array size divided by the wavelength to the one half power times mass to the minus one quarter over mass to the one quarter. So as an example, if I were to point the laser, this laser pointer that I'm pointing at the screen at an ant that weighs one gram for a week, I could get that ant to move at a millimeter per second by radiation pressure, assuming no other forces in the problem. So I'm going to have to have more laser power than that. That's why I need a very high power, uh, maybe 50 to 100 gigawatts to get to 0.2c to accelerate one gram in 10 minutes using a laser with a wavelength of one micron a sail area of four meters by four meters um, that produces a diffraction limited beam spot size at a size of two million kilometers. Um, and this idea, by the way, was already thought about by this fellow Bob Forward uh, in 1962, 18 months after the invention of the laser. So Ted Maiman here at Hughes Research Lab in Malibu invented the Ruby laser at the same time that Charles Townis invented the uh, uh, laser in Berkeley, uh, and Forward, who was one of the lab mates of Maiman, already thought about ways to use lasers for radiation pressure propulsion. Uh, and, and this drawing encoded in his 1962 paper was sort of a crude version of what we're thinking about today. So what are the issues for the materials challenges? We have a mass of a gram, area call it 10 square meters, 
acceleration time of 1,000 seconds. We need to have very, very low absorption coefficient, other than, otherwise the material will burn up. Uh, we have to have an uh, absorption coefficient of 10 to the minus 5. We'll explain why that is important. We need to have reflectance that's relatively high over a broad spectral range. And the reason is, as we go from rest to point 0.2c, there's a Doppler shift uh, such that the laser or some parent frequency is Doppler shifted by about 20% of the, uh, the wavelength when it's at rest. Um, so let's think about some of the materials candidates, the photonic design, some of the thermal and mechanical issues. I won't go too much into the fabrication, uh, but we'll talk a little bit about measurement and characterization. So this is our sort of uh, picture, and, and there will be a paper available uh, hopefully later this month or early next month um, about this that describes some of the, this sort of material selection exercise I'm telling you about today. Um, and in thinking about materials, we want materials that have very, very low absorption coefficient, and this is absorption expressed in inverse centimeters, mass density, which of course is as low as possible in grams per cubic centimeter, and high refractive index, because it's easier to make uh, dielectric optics and highly reflective materials with high refractive index. So these are materials that pop out as interesting materials. So crystalline silicon is a good material. Diamond is a good material. Uh, some of the chalcogenides, uh, tin sulfide, molybdenum disulfide, molybdenum diselenide, may be all uh, interesting materials to use. So the Doppler shift, of course, uh, is, if you think just about special relativity, the observed frequency at, by the laser, which is sitting on the Earth, uh, is changing as the uh, sail accelerates and changes its velocity. And so it's going to shift by about 20%, and the laser frequency will go down about 80% of its frequency. With the, so the laser light will appear red-shifted to the sail. Um, so I'm going to say a little bit about how to do design. And this is sort of a design exercise um, that's determined by a multivariate constraint optimization problem. Uh, and we're interested in uh, sort of exacting a trade-off between many different properties of this sale and identifying candidate structures. And so our approach is to use a multivariate design optimization across different classes of nanophotonic structures. I'll show them to you in a minute. And the design exercise involved a total of more than 100,000 uh, electromagnetic simulations uh, of the uh, electromagnetic modes and, uh, and, and, and fields. So these are the structures that we're going to look at. We're going to look at dielectric slabs, just a uniform thickness, homogeneous dielectric slab, just a sheet of material. A multi-layer stack. So imagine you had high index sheets with low index sheets of a material like aerogel between them. Uh, and up to maybe seven layers. A uh, so-called 2D photonic crystal. This is a motif that's familiar to optical electronics people. We can make structures that exhibit guided modes and band gaps within the plane using a film that has a periodic array of holes. Uh, this gives rise to block-like modes for light, uh, uh, periodic uh, modes for light in the, inside the film. And this is uh, a structure that I talked to you about yesterday with arrays of antennas, in this case not metallic because we need low absorption. These are dielectric antennas. And we've permuted all of these variables, the thickness, the number of layers, the period of these structures, their radius, and their height uh, through uh, uh, with a variety of different materials, silicon, diamond, and these two metal chalcogenides. Uh, so for each of them, we would like to find to optimize them relative to some figure of merit. And the question is, what should that figure of merit be? Um, so we started with thinking about what are the figure of merit. And we have many different points where we seeded the algorithm. And we decided there, there are a couple possible figures of merit. First would be just make the reflectance as high as possible. That seems fairly intuitively reasonable. Uh, so you have more momentum. And if the reflectance is very high, you could prevent, uh, little, you could per perhaps mitigate the absorption. Or you could use as your figure of merit to make the acceleration distance to reach the final velocity be as short as possible. And that's really what you care about. Uh, because that doesn't, uh, that's, that's really just telling you you're minimizing the energy cost required because that's the time that the laser has to be on. Uh, so it's directly related to the required size, cost, and of the phased array laser, which is the most expensive part of the system. 
So this is sort of in the Ashby spirit of material selection. We're going to design for our system application the performance characteristics of the material that minimizes or you know, advances some specific goal, in this case related to this very costly element. Uh, so the acceleration distance is now related to the speed of light, the area of the sail, uh, the reflectivity, this relativistic correction, velocity, and so forth. And so I can compute this distance that I need to. Uh, and uh, so for those structures that I showed you, we permuted over and made a, uh, uh, about uh, a, li a little more than 100,000 different simulations. Um, and here's what we found. We found an array of solutions where the reflectance was close to 100%. And the good news is that uh, for the two candidate materials we analyzed in detail, molybdenum disulfide, multilayer molybdenum disulfide, like the th materials I showed you we made solar cells of on Tuesday, or thin films of crystalline silicon, there are many solutions. I, I have uh, uh, photonic crystals, I have uh, uh, slabs, I have stacks of materials that all work. But you can actually do even better, and this is somewhat counterintuitive, by relaxing the demand on having the reflectance be close to 100% and say, and notice this is an inverse scale, large distance for acceleration is on the bottom, short distance is on the top here. Um, uh, and so this is the optimal solution. Uh, it's, in this case, it's a photonic crystal that looks like this. And the reason is very simple. By putting holes in the photonic crystal, we take away some of the weight. And so it turns out we can give up a lot of reflectance in our design optimization in favor of getting rid of the weight. And so that has a reflectivity, uh, can reach 0.2c according to this analysis in even less than 1,000 seconds. And this actually, surprisingly, you would have thought perhaps the optimal one would have a reflectivity in 99.9% .9 or across this whole band. This is the reflectivity of the optimal structure. By giving up the weight, we were able to, sac we, we could, the optimal solution told us we could sacrifice. So this is, tells you that multivariate optimization and learning can lead you in counterintuitive or non-intuitive directions. Um, that this is the reflectance profile. It's actually not very reflecting at all until it gets up to here. It's not even 100% here, uh, and it goes down. And this is the entire bandwidth over which uh, the the, the uh, sail experiences the light as it accelerates. Okay, what about the actual physical characteristics from an optical sense of the materials? All the materials we're talking about are dielectric materials. They have wide energy gaps. Um, therefore, they have absorption at short wavelengths. They have coupling between the optical phonons uh, and the lattice at long wavelengths, the so-called Rastralin band or phonon polariton modes. They also have defects that give rise to color centers, uh, that give the crystals physical color from, due to trap to band transitions. So these are the generic characteristics of these materials. So what we need is to have materials that have very, very low absorption coefficients. So this is the absorption coefficient in inverse centimeters of materials that we found data for, molybdenum disulfide, amorphous silicon, crystalline silicon, uh, or, or diamond, and here crystalline silicon. Um, and then we also need to have, uh, th th it's important, we need to have very low absorption at the pump laser wavelength right about here. But we also can't have lossless material here because we have to have some emissivity. I talked about the balance between absorption and emission yesterday. We have to have a material that has finite emittance. So we need to have some emittance, some absorption here at long wavelengths outside the pump laser wavelength band such that we can use black body radiation to cool the sail. That turns out to be very important. So I won't go into this in detail. We have uh, methods that were developed first uh, at Lawrence Berkeley Labs and used actually to characterize the mirrors for the LIGO Michelson interferometer called photothermal deflection and photoacoustic spectroscopy. They basically measure a temperature induced refractive index and they can make uh, measurements of refractive index that are a couple of orders of magnitude more sensitive than we can by ellipsometry or conventional transmission measurements. Uh, and so these measurements have been made for diamond and silicon. These measurements are pretty old. Uh, that tells me they may not be wrong, but they may not, they, they, we might be able to improve upon uh, the materials performance and also the measurement sensitivity 
uh, of these instruments. So I think there's going to be a need for new measurement science to address ultra-low absorption coefficients. Uh, so this is what some of these apparatus looks like. I won't go into this in a lot of detail. Um, uh, photothermal deflection invented by this guy Warren Jackson and he went, later went to Xerox Park. So thermal management. I mentioned in order to do thermal management I have to have some emissivity and so for example in the case where I have uh, a, a, a light sail that is made out of a dielectric material that contains uh, that has phonon polaritons in the 10 micron or 10 to 20 micron range I have now some absorption and therefore some emission of light and radiation at this wavelength. And so what we found was that by making laminates, say, of a highly reflective material at the pump wavelength like silicon, and silicon dioxide, which is transparent at the pump wavelength, but which has these phonon polariton or restrolin bands. This, in fact, is the uh, refractive index and absorption for silicon dioxide around 10 microns. Many of you may know if you've ever shined a long wavelength laser, silicon dioxide, which is transparent and the visible, is opaque at 10 microns. So this allows the uh, appropriate balance. And even with uh, emissivities uh, in the range of 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 4, we could keep the temperature of the sail to maybe 5 to 700 Kelvin. So uh, a couple hundred degrees C, which is probably acceptable within the range of things we're interested in. What about mechanical properties? Uh, well, I look for your feedback, but here's what we've thought about, which is, first of all, most of these materials are basically ceramic or brittle materials, so they have incredibly high compressive stresses. Uh, you have to worry about shear, but just the hydrostatic compression, uh, there's, there's really no issue. They have high moduli. But they are very, they're delicate in tension. So what about the tensile stresses? So we decided to make an analysis, say, assume we had a structure the size of a light sail, that was, a, say, a disk or a sphere, what rotational speed could it get to before the material at the edge of the sail exceeded the tensile yield stress of the material? Uh, and so here are some typical tensile yield stresses for boron nitride, silicon nitride, aluminum nitride, amorphous silicon, and so forth in the range of uh, 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 11 pascals. Uh, and so that basically tells you I could tolerate rotation of the sail up to, for the diameters we're talking about, a few square meters, up to a few tens of hertz uh, or so. You wouldn't want it to rotate faster than that uh, for fear that you would uh, compromise the tensile strength. At least that's my, my uh, picture of this. So what about the stability of the sail itself? It's, it's, a, it's a dielectric passive object. It's moving so fast I can't do feedback control of the communication. It just has to ride on the sail, just like a, a optical tweezers traps a little bead, or like uh, you know, these fountains of air can suspend a ping pong ball. It has to be passively stable and to have a, basically a little uh, a potential well, uh, an optically induced potential well. So we want to design the optical properties of this so that we have such a potential well. So we can write down uh, basically a force equation. Uh, and, we, and in fact, this is a sort of six-axis uh, model where we can uh, look at the uh, displacements and forces in uh, x, y, z uh, and uh, r theta phi. Uh, and it's dependent on the beam profile, the reflectivity, uh, the angle of incidence, the absorption, and the beam propagation. So this is the governing equation. I won't go through it in detail, but it's a rather simple governing equation. Uh, that, that captures most of the important dynamics. So here's an analysis. This is done by Avi Loeb, my friend uh, as an astronomer at Harvard, Zach Manchester, who is a mechanical engineer at Stanford. By the way, this tells you something about this field. It's bringing together astronomers and mechanical engineers. Uh, and this, they did an analysis of what would happen if you had a donut-shaped beam and you had a spherical dielectric sail with forces acting on it. And if you have some uh, un un unbalancing of, the, uh, of this uh, donut-shaped potential, you could start to induce rotations. So uh, this, the sphere is stable as long as it doesn't rotate. That's good. The stresses are compressive. That's, that's good mechanically. Um, and then some of the other things that you worry about are uh, what happens when the sail tips off, off axis? Is it going to wander away, away from the beam? What happens uh, when the radiation pressure deforms the sail? 
Uh, does the net force still give it the right uh, velocity? Um, and how does the mass distribution affect the, the problem? And so what we're going to do is actually look at some un un unconventional optical designs. Uh, so for example, one thing you can do is to make uh, the sail be here a parabolic uh, shape, a paraboloid. Uh, and even uh, if I choose a paraboloid with a safe radius of curvature, not too sharp, not a cone, cones are unstable, uh, a Gaussian beam, it can be stably coupled to this structure. I can write down all the equations of motion. Uh, uh, I can linearize them. In fact, I can keep the full nonlinear uh, solutions. Uh, and I have stable solutions. I, we've, we've done this. We've, uh, and I'll just show you what they look like. This is an example of a paraboloid. And this z-axis whizzing by is a scale. It's, it's traveling here um, at uh, meters per second. And you can see relative to the initial, uh, let me start this again. Yeah, it's, it starts out and it has some uh, axisymmetric instability, but it settles down uh, and it has a stable, and it ex exhibits stable oscillatory motion around the center point of the laser beam. So it actually has a, an attractor basin for the solution of the trajectories. Uh, as long as you have a certain Gaussian beam shape and radi radius of curvature. Um, so now, I, what I talked about yesterday was the idea of patterning the surface and making metasurfaces. So I can change the dispersion of light. Here's an example making a lens by, and I talked about antenna arrays yesterday. So instead of just using the specular reflection from the bulk optics, I could use the dispersion or the angular distribution of light to stabilize the sail. And here's an example of the trajectory. And this shows the trajectory of a sail that first moves off axis, but the angular distribution of the scattered radiation steers it back on axis and back on axis and so forth. So it stably oscillates around the center trajectory. So now we can combine the photonic design here uh, with the shape of the sail. In fact, this is for a disk, so I, it's completely flat. And you can see just by making this photonic angular dispersion be controlled, I can apparently make stable solutions. So OK, I talked about some pretty fantastic numbers, 100 gigawatts, the laser so big no one's ever built it, uh, kilometer size, 10 meter square structure, it's 100 nanometers thick, sounds, sounds pretty spectacular, maybe a little uh, imaginary. Let's think about what we could do using materials that we already have today. Uh, so for example, at some, many places and a number of laboratories around the world, we have lasers with power already available in the 100 uh, kilowatt to 10 megawatt range. So if we had a sail that was less than 10 square meters, say, uh, uh, was only uh, uh, now uh, 10 centimeters or uh, a centimeter in size, I could still, even with uh, 100 kilowatt to 10 megawatt power, with available lasers achieve velocities that are higher than the velocity of the Voyager spacecraft by a factor of 10. Alrighty, so, so with the things we have available today, we could be launching structures that move 10 times faster than some of our fastest spacecraft. So I think this is, we don't have to go all the way up here before we start doing things that are exciting and interesting from an engineering point of view. Um, okay, so what is the, the sort of vision here? Scalable space exploration with photon propulsion. So we can get across this map, maybe launching spacecraft ultimately to the, our nearby stars. But for example, if we could go to 20% of the light speed, the travel time to Enceladus, the moon of Saturn that's expected to have an Earth-like ocean, which has an Earth-like ocean, would be five hours. If you're a graduate student, you could launch the spacecraft and the next morning you'd have the data. Rather than in Cassini, where the, data, the spacecraft took 12 years to go that same distance. So I think it could really revolutionize planetary exploration and planet ex exploration of our solar system. OK, so I want to, just before I quit, um, once again acknowledge the fantastic young people who have been involved in this project. We, this is a group, we, we, had, we started out with no funding for this. In fact, we, we have some discretionary funding. This was simply so irresistible to this group of people that they spent their Saturdays and Sundays meeting with me, um, going over and doing some of the preliminary uh, engineering and materials design. 
I'll point out Deep Jarwal is uh, now at University of Pennsylvania. Michelle is at MIT. Um, uh, uh, and uh, Mike Kelsenberg is a staff member at Caltech, uh, and the rest of these are, are graduate students and, and postdocs in our group, and they are the people that really uh, make this all possible. So thanks very much. Questions? Okay, I saw it. Uh, Will, I think I saw your hand first. I was wondering if it was possible or considered to induce a gyroscopic effect to stabilize it. Be so, within the limits of the, and I, I, I'm looking here for some of the mechanics people to correct me, I think the issue is just the tensile yield stress of the material. So, I think it would help, but actually, the analysis, I, the stability analysis that I uh, talked about didn't require any uh, uh, angular momentum. Um, in fact, we're thinking that maybe we could actually make the laser uh, sail uh, be polarization sensitive so that a pol correct, uh, some linear polarized laser beam could actually lock in the orientation of the sail and maybe you could then rotate it at some, you could rotate the polarization which you can do electronically uh, with a uh, uh, with a, uh, um, uh, a la power combining uh, la laser beam, a synthetic uh, beam, um, and rotate it at whatever frequency you want to actively. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, in materials, what about for a thing, at least heavy and also? So I, that's the question I am most often asked. Why not? What about graphene? And graphene did not show up on my slides. The problem, and I love graphene. I uh, work with graphene. Graphene will never work at the high power densities needed because the absorption coefficient is too high. So it really, the, 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 the key insight that came out of this analysis was I expected that many materials would be possible and that if we just made the reflectivity 99.999%, that doesn't matter. What matters is that the absorbance be very, very low at the wavelength. So graphene unfortunately loses out. That this has already been proposed by other researchers, and unfortunately, I don't think it's viable. Yeah. Back to the halide perovskite yes. solar absorber materials. Is there any mechanistic understanding as to why they are so radiation resistant? And if I understood you correctly, they can recover. Yes. In yes. Darkness. Um, th is there is. Form defects or. Yeah, um, so, so the, the thing that's remarkable about these materials, I didn't, I didn't dive into this and I, I, I could certainly do so. Um, they are almost liquid-like at room temperature. They have uh, mean atomic displacements of like 15 to 20 percent uh, at room temperature, which is almost the melting criterion, right? Uh, so these are materials that are very unusual. They're not, uh, they, they have very soft phonons. Um, so, so they're very unusual, and that is one of the reasons why we think they don't have deep electronic states in the middle of the band gap, which is why they're such good solar materials. So it's, they're almost liquid-like, and they, their, their bond rearrangements locally are, are very facile. That sounds fascinating. Yeah. Al, and then John, and then splitted to that. So um, these uh, perovskites, they are not cubic from but I so they have domain walls, etc. And in piezoelectrics, we use radiation hardening sometimes to stabilize domain walls. How much uh, the, uh, does that kind of uh, presence of domain walls affect and, uh, this radiation? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't think they are piezoelectric in the state that is used in photovoltaics, yeah, 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 but. but still. Uh, by, by the way, one thing I should also mention is that uh, in some of the perovskite materials, there's also ion transport as well. There's ion rearrangements in the lattice. It's, uh, they're, they're, they're very, um, uh, there's a great deal of atomic motion uh, at the unit cell level in the material. Yeah, so it, I, I, that's why I'm hesitating because I don't know the answer uh, whether at lower temperatures it might be. Uh, I suspect uh, you might be able to see a phase transformation. Yeah. Yeah, Harry, you showed like in your search for the optimum material and structure. Obviously, there's different things you want to try to maximize or minimize, and you showed that 
in addition to the material, you could make a structure with pores in it. Yeah. Of some amount and size. Could, could you describe a little bit more about how you've done that already? How did you put it okay. in a regular array? Uh, and yeah. So those those are made fairly routinely by by practitioners of uh, uh, making uh, photonic crystals. You can make them in a uh, clean room or by a printing process, uh, an etching process. You can make holes in a thin film, and we make 2D photonic crystals. In fact, uh, many waveguides and lasers and so forth depend on these arrays of holes. Uh, Very conventional. Pretty conventional, yeah, actually. So that was uh, not. Um, so, so I should say that the uh, con the uh, consequences of doing that for the mechanical properties haven't been analyzed. Uh, so whether that's going to end up, uh, and that's that's an important. There's a lot of work to do here. Um, I don't want, I don't in any way. This is very much the beginning rather than the end of the story. And the sizes of those were roughly what the oh, board. Oh, uh, so the, the the yeah. So they're uh, they're they're in the range of a uh, few hundreds of nanometers, something like that. So they're relatively small. They're their wavelength scale uh, uh, within the silicon. Uh, uh, so, yeah. So, I don't know if you're finished answering the previous question. <laughs> but, okay, back to the perovskites. It's so surprising to me to find out that ultimately their benefit is in sort of their efficiency per weight because they have all heavy atoms in it, like yeah. iodine. So is it ultimately because you can make them so thin because yes, they're so that's fantastically right. absorbed? Yeah, they're very, they're very, very high absorption coefficients. Um, and uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, and in fact, uh, the other feature about the way radiation interacts with the materials is that um, they're so thin that uh, all the protons and electrons go straight through the material. So if you think about how uh, energetic particles lose, ener lose their energy in materials, for heavy particles like protons or uh, heavy atoms, the displacement defects are always produced near the end of range when they come almost to rest. And while the particle is going swiftly through a material, it generates electronic excitations. So I think that may be part of it is that the, all the, the damaging particles, are the layers so thin they just go straight on through. Uh, and so you have electronic excitations. Um, there is some, you know, there's some electronic effects. We see what an apparent dopant deactivation, um, which you don't fully understand and trying to understand, but, uh, but, it, but no uh, irreversible damage. Yeah. yeah. One thing I think they have, a little bit of a bad news is I think they're not only unstable in moist air and moisture, but they're also, I think, somewhat unstable on the influence of UV light itself. Mm. And there are other crystal structures that are competing that some of us theorists calculating we think are even actually the, the ultimate stable form of these materials. So yeah, there's the, the still story is still being very much written. Yeah, yeah. So I, I didn't uh, give much backstory, but there are literally thousands of researchers around the world, for those who are not in this field, who are working on looking at properties of the perovskite materials. Um, and, and, and that's true. Uh, and, and Recent data suggests that there are some versions of the material that have uh, um, uh, less and less residual solute or solvent um, that are more stable, uh, have less uh, ion uh, uh, unwanted ionic transport uh, during the cell operation that make the material more stable under ultraviolet radiation. But it's a complex story with many nuances. Yeah. Okay, I'm scanning the room for student questions. Uh, so I'll do you, and then you, Dave. Uh, I have a question. I said uh, the laser, like uh, the power laser is pretty large. And uh, so I'm considering during the propelling process with the you know, the laser would either lead to the temperature rising of the, the whole week or even damage it. So the temperature rise of what? Uh, of, uh, of the uh, sail? Of the sail? Uh, yeah, sail. OK. That's why the absorption coefficient has to be very, very low. Uh, if, if the material is not absorbing at the pump wavelength, then uh, the temperature rise, even these power densities can be, that, that's what these uh, 
uh, calculations. So, so of course, we have to verify this experimentally. We're actually building experimental systems to do this right now. Uh, but the k suggestions are that if we can get the absorption down to 10 to the minus 5 or lower, uh, that the temperature, that, that the so little laser power will be absorbed uh, that the black body radiation to the cold background of space can maintain the temperature of the sail in steady state at hundreds of Kelvin you know, or, or uh, a few hundred degrees C or so. Ideally, you'd like a mirror, yeah, but, but the, the reality is that in all mirrors, some of the light penetrates in as it comes back out. So that's why you need a lossless mirror, yeah. yeah. And the whole purpose of the sail is just as a surface to be pushed. That's right, yeah. So it, it, yeah, that's its function, yeah. So I was, I was struggling with the orbital mechanics of having your laser array fixed on planet Earth, which is rotating and wobbling and, and orbiting the sun and trying to hit this object far away. It seems to me that in your force balance, this is going to be an impulse. It, it's not a steady beam that's going to encounter it, but there will be interruptions to the beam. And so the interaction with the sail is, is going to be an on-off. Uh, I'm not quite sure I'm following. So uh, you're on the Earth, yes. and you're fixed, and your beam is fixed, and, yes. and the Earth is rotating. Yes. But your object is out here, so there must be some oh, oh, okay. angles at yeah. which your beam is not going to be able to hit that. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. So the entire duration of the impulse is about a thousand seconds. Yeah. Um, and so the, the, the uh, phased array can steer the beam to maintain uh, its Gaussian beam focus on the sail right. during that time. The, there's, there's a, the, in a thousand seconds, the Earth is rotating, right. but the, the steering can compensate because I can steer a phased array beam. But, but from the material aspect and your momentum, you, you have a beam of momentum that you're pushing the sail. Mm -hmm. It's going to be an on-off. And I'm wondering in your, your dynamic forces, if, if you look at that. I, I'm, I'm, maybe we should talk about this later. I don't quite see the on-off nature of it, but uh, OK, yeah. And so I'm going to take our last question, because tonight uh, Professor Atwater is going to be driving to Dayton. So we want to make sure he gets dinner and he can uh, head out. So no. so you were talking about, you know, uh, this was a uh, Julian type uh, sort of space. Uh, and you know to have this the low angle or so, and that was with the sail. Is there use for that sail after its initial oh. acceleration, or can it just uh, dispatch and just? That is a subject of debate among people in the project. Some people say its its job is done. Uh, other people would like to use this sail as the uh, as an antenna for the communications aperture to beam information back. Uh, and the question of whether that's a viable scheme will probably depend on the damage it experiences in the interstellar medium. If you go to astronomy journals or consult your favorite astronomer, they can only bracket the density of the interstellar medium now within about two and a half orders of magnitude. So there are some things we still don't know about the, the universe. So. OK, well, I would like to. Thank Professor Atwater one more time and bring the 2018 Van Horn Distinguished Lectureship to a close.